Hello and welcome to this week's homework video. In this video, we're going to continue talking about biodiversity and ecosystems. One of the general features of many ecosystems in our world is that they are very stable over long periods of time, but then occasionally they will change very dramatically. And so we're going to be looking at what makes an ecosystem so stable and then what causes them to change. Let's make sure that we can define what biodiversity is in the first place. Biodiversity is a measurement of how many different organisms are interacting together in an ecosystem. This ecosystem here is part of the Gorongosa National Park, which is in Mozambique. It's at the very southern tip of the Great African Rift Valley, and it's a very diverse ecosystem. The diversity is due to many different factors which include the different terrains from mountains and grasslands to giant valleys and a very large lake in the center of the park. Another reason that this ecosystem is so biodiverse is because of the various interactions of the organisms, which is what we're going to be mostly focusing on. Biodiversity can be measured at many different scales, from very small to very large. One of the ways that we measure biodiversity is in species richness, which is just the total number of different species interacting together. And so scientists will just go out into the field and count up how many different species they can find. Often though, that they, they do this at a specific scale. So instead of counting all of the organisms, they'll count up just all of the organisms of one type. They might be sort of small. They might be counting up how many different insects interact together in this ecosystem. Or they might count up how many different animals there are. Um, in this picture here, there are a bunch of water buck back here. There's a lion. And there's one white bird uh, over here. So we would say that the species richness of this ecosystem, or of this picture, is three. There's a richness of three because there are three different organisms. Here are some more water buck. But in this picture, you could also focus on just counting up the different types of plants. We would have one species here, this tree, which is taking up the majority of the space. But there's another type of tree over here, so that would make two. There's some long grass here and some short shrubs here. And if you wanted to get really close, you could look at just a small patch of the plants and see what different species are all living in a very tiny area. Scientists can even go smaller than that. And they'll occasionally count up the different microorganisms living in a certain environment. Now this is an image of some microorganisms that would live in a pond or a lake um, under a microscope. And so you could go through and count up what organisms these are of various types and count up how many different species are all together. Another way that we measure biodiversity is in species abundance. Now this one's a little bit more tricky than species richness. Here, we want to see how many individuals in each species there are and how much of the ecosystem they make up. When we're measuring species abundance, we want to see, is there one species that is disproportionately taking up the majority of the space in an ecosystem? In this picture here, we can see that there is a disproportionate number of elephants and this one type of grass. This ecosystem, or this picture, has a very uneven distribution of species. It's primarily made up of elephants and this long grass. Whereas in this image, which either comes from a zoo or is fake, I'm not sure, could be both, this picture would show a very even distribution. You can see a couple zebra, a couple ostriches, a few gazelle, a giraffe, and another giraffe back here, an elephant. This would have a much more even distribution. There's not just one species that is dominating over all the others. One of the patterns that we see in ecosystems is that the most stable ecosystems have a very high biodiversity. So that makes us wonder, why does biodiversity 
lead to such stable ecosystems? What is the cause and effect of this biodiversity, and why does it make an ecosystem not change very often? And what many different studies have found is that it's due to the complexity of a food web. If a food web like this one over here is very complex with lots of feeding interactions at many different trophic levels, that means there are a lot of interactions. And each of these organisms have to compete with the others in order to get enough resources. And that prevents any one of the species from becoming too dominant. So that competition leads to stability. And if you remove just a single organism, there are so many other organisms in this food web that the population, that the ecosystem will stay very stable. Compare that to this other food web, which is much less complex. In this one, there are fewer feeding interactions, which means there is less competition for resources. And if you were to remove a single organism from this food web, large portions of the food web would change and the ecosystem itself would change. So when scientists are studying a food web, they look for a couple features. They look to see if there is one dominant species. A dominant species is one in an ecosystem that makes up the majority of the biomass of an ecosystem. In this picture here, we can see a lot of wildebeest and a lot of grass. So those two organisms make up the majority of the biomass of this ecosystem. And so those two species would be the dominant species. The results of this is that there's more likely to be a lot of disease that is passed from one organism to the next just because the disease can spread so easily and quickly to all these different wildebeest. And it also means that there's less competition for the same food that these wildebeest are eating. The grass is growing efficiently, the wildebeest are growing efficiently, but any disruption to this ecosystem would cause it to become very unstable. A dominant species can be contrasted with a keystone species. Now, these organisms don't live in the Gorongosa National Park, but it's a good example that I wanted to use. A keystone species is one that has a very small population in the overall ecosystem, but it plays a very strong role. It's not like the dominant species where they have a lot of biomass, but they do have a very strong impact on how the ecosystem works. Um, oftentimes, a keystone species are predators. In the example over here, which is not from the Gorongosa National Park, is of sea otters. Sea otters eat sea urchins. The sea urchins, which are these little spiky things down here, like to feed on the roots of kelp. And so in the Pacific Ocean, there are large kelp forests that only exist when there are sea otters. Now, the sea otters don't interact with the kelp at all. They just eat these sea urchins. But if the sea otters are removed, the sea urchins eat all of the kelp and the kelp forest ecosystem is destroyed. But keystone species don't always have to be predators. For example, in the Sonoran Desert in Arizona and northern Mexico, hummingbirds are the keystone species because they help to pollinate the cactus, which provides food for many other organisms. Another example could be elephants, these giant herbivores. In many parts of Africa, the elephant eats these acacia trees. And if it weren't for the elephants, the acacia trees would overgrow and make a forest across the ground uh, and push out any of the grass and any of these other smaller bushes and smaller trees. Elephants are some of the only organisms that can eat acacia trees, and they prevent the acacia trees from becoming the dominant species. And by doing so, they allow many other organisms, bushes and grasses, to grow, which feed many other organisms in the Gorongosa National Park. Scientists use models of ecological systems, like a food web, 
to determine if there is a dominant or keystone species. Essentially, they do experiments where they will go in and remove one species, they'll kick it, and see what happens. They'll see, they'll, they will try to measure the change in the food web of other populations to see what impact the one species that they removed had. So they will measure species richness and species abundance after removing one single organism and to, to see how stable that food web is or if it might change. With the impact that humans have on many ecosystems, that question is very important. Will this ecosystem change or will it stay stable if we remove one of these organisms, if one of these organisms accidentally goes extinct? So that's all for now. I hope that made sense. And if you have any questions, make sure you write them down and I will see you in class.